Am I wrong for telling my mom she is dead to me if she mentors my bully? So my 16 male, mom 40 female, is a teacher at my school. Our teacher has a special elective you can take, which is being a teacher's aide during your elective period. It's mostly stuff like grading papers for them, making copies, mentoring, etc. It's pretty much always just the teacher's favorite student at the time. I found out at the beginning of the semester that my mom chose Dave, 17 male, to be her TA. Dave has made my life a living nightmare since middle school. He has bullied me mercilessly, both physically and emotionally, since 6th grade. I don't want to get into everything he's done to me, but everyone is fully aware of it including the school and my parents. There have been countless meetings with school administration and suspension on his end, but it never stopped him. Since we've been in high school and I hadn't seen him that much, which is a relief, but the times that I do are always terrible. When I found out that he was her new TA, I was obviously very hurt and confused. I asked her why would she want to spend extra time with someone who made my life so terrible. She said that she had him in one of her classes and that he really isn't such a bad kid, but he has a really terrible home life that she can't tell me about that makes him act out. For the record, my mom has always had a soft fought for the kid who comes from bad homes. I reminded her of all the things he had done to me and she said that she understands but he really needs help right now. I told her I get that but why does it have to be you? We have a huge school full of teachers and staff who can mentor him. Why does it have to be you? She told me to stop being selfish and some kids have it harder than I could imagine and she's just trying to help. I was honest with her and told her that if she continued to have him as her aide, she was dead to me. She was choosing him over me and she would no longer be my mother. I would no longer talk to her in the minute I turned 18. I was moving out and she would never hear from me again. She rolled her eyes and said I was being dramatic, but after a couple of days of ignoring her, I was grounded. It didn't change my mind and my dad then tried to force me to talk to her. I still refused, so they pretty much took everything away from me one by one for the past few weeks. I no longer have my car, computer, guitar, and most recently my art supplies, and I have to come home from school and go straight to my room and I'm not allowed out except for dinner unless I start talking to her again. They don't realize that this is just strengthening my resolve. I'm going to sit in this empty room every day silently until I'm 18 and they'll never see me again. My mom keeps coming in crying and begging me to talk to her which makes me feel kind of bad but she still won't remove Dave as her aide. Am I taking this too far? I just feel so betrayed. I would say you're not the asshole and let me explain why. People are going to disagree with me. I get that. But your family is your safe space, right? The two people who are supposed to protect you in this world is your mom and dad. And if this man being her aid bothers you, your mom has to put you first and not this other kid. That's not her child. You're right in the sense where there's other teachers. I get he has a hard life, uh, home life. I get that. But you are your mom's first priority. And she is pushing you kind of to the back burner. And for her to take it this far, she sees how much hurt you're going through by not talking to her. And she it's not clicking for her. And what to top it all off, what has caused this disconnect? The same bully from sixth grade. And that would piss me off even more. I'm like, look, you're letting this person still ruin my life. And you're not getting it. The bullying is still happening. Whether the mom sees it or not, it's still happening. You don't think that kid is getting some sort of like, oh, I'm still bothering this kid. I know he hates that I'm his mom's aide. You don't think he probably sucks up to you? Like, come on, like, no better. Like, you got to be on your kid's side. You're their number one. Am I wrong for telling my sister that I won't change my wedding? So I'm 27 and I'm getting married to my fiance Raj, who's 29, in a couple of months. We are having a traditional, lavish Indian wedding, which has been a dream of mine since childhood. I grew up in a mixed household. My father is Hindu, while my mother is Christian. We celebrated both religions growing up, but I always felt more of a connection to my father's Hindu traditions. Now, my sister Sarah is 25 and she is getting married right around the same time as I am. Now, she identifies more with our mother's Christian faith and is planning a traditional Christian wedding. Now, recently, my sister Sarah approached me, expressing concerns that our weddings being so close together might overshadow hers, especially since mine is more extravagant than hers and involves multiple days of celebration. Sarah asked if I could either tone down my wedding, consider postponing it, or make it a fully Christian ceremony to balance things out. She believes that having two weddings so close together, with one being significantly grander, would take attention away from hers and create unnecessary stress for our family. Who are the ones who have to juggle both events? 
I told her I understand her concerns, but I've been planning my wedding for over a year and it means a lot to me to have it the way I always imagined it. I pointed out that our cultural backgrounds are different and that both weddings will be special in their own ways. Additionally, postponing my wedding would be a huge inconvenience and financial burden given the extensive preparations and bookings already in place. Our wedding dates are three weeks apart. We have separate guest lists, but there is still some overlap with close family and mutual friends. My mother is siding with Sarah and believes I should change my wedding to a fully Christian ceremony, or at the very least incorporate significant Christian elements. My father, on the other hand, supports my decision and believes we should both have the weddings that we want. Sarah's really upset and accused me of not caring about her feelings. She thinks I'm prioritizing my wedding over our family's well-being. And now my mother has been constantly going overboard with criticizing everything. She's even threatened to not attend my wedding if I don't have a Christian ceremony. She's been calling family members to try to get them on her and Sarah's side and get them to boycott my wedding if I don't comply. My father has been trying to mediate, but the situation is getting more tense by the day. Sarah and I have always had a complicated relationship. And while we do support each other, there's often tension because of our different personalities. Now I'm feeling torn. I don't want to hurt my sister or cause a family rift. But I also don't want to sacrifice my dream wedding. I'm also not in her bridal party or anything like that. As she has her wedding and I have mine. No one is helping with the wedding costs as I inherited a lot from my great-grandfather. I also gave 40% of what he gave me to my sister. So am I wrong for telling my sister that I won't change my wedding? Bye. Am I the asshole for banning my daughter from going to her best friend's house? My daughter and her best friend Will have been friends since they were five. I let her sleep over at his house sometimes. They're 13. Her best friend is a really sweet boy and I love their dynamic. I think the both of them are adorable, but I don't think I can continue letting her go to his house. This is so insane, but my daughter fell and broke her arm while at their house. Accidents happen, so I would have been understanding if his mom had called me. But she did it. No, you're not the asshole. My baby broke her arm and you didn't call to tell me anything. She will never go to your house again because I can't trust you. I had no idea about it until my daughter came home the next day. She didn't have a phone because hers was broken and I haven't gotten around to buying her a new one yet. We've had a lot of expenses. So I trusted the parents would call me if there was an issue. But no, she spent the night at their house and then walked home with her best friend. So his parents didn't even walk her home while her arm was broken. That's fucked up. That's fucked up. My baby's arm was broken and y'all didn't even have the decency to come and talk to my face. You didn't call me, which is fucked up on its own, but you didn't even have the decency to walk my baby home and talk to me about it face to fucking face. You let two 13 year olds tell me that my baby broke her arm last night. Oh, hell no. Girl, no, no, no. The most insane part of all of this is that his mom is a nurse, so there isn't any excuse. I told her that I find it really messed up that she didn't tell me and it turned into a whole argument. She said my daughter seemed fine and she was playing afterwards and she was too exhausted to take her to the hospital. Wait a minute. So the baby walked home. They didn't even go to the hospital? So... No. Okay, so I completely had it wrong. I had it fucking wrong. Baby girl broke her arm, did not have a cast. I thought they took her to the hospital. No, she didn't take her to the hospital. She came home with a broken arm. Arm still broke, not set, and got no cast, nothing wrapped around it, no ice. Uh, no, you are absolutely not the asshole. Oh my God. Oh my God. She said my daughter seemed fine and she was playing afterwards and she was too exhausted to take her to the hospital. She said she knew I would make a big deal out of nothing, out of nothing. So she thought it could wait. Are you typing this from jail?
please telling me you are using a butt phone to upload this story because the way I would have peeled this bitch muffin cap back blue, because the fuck you mean you're going to make a big deal about nothing. So I figured it could wait. Bitch, my baby's arm is broken. There are over 200 bones in the human body, bitch, and they were all fine when I sent my baby to your house. But when you when she comes home, one of them is broke. Uh, bitch, an uh, arm for an arm. Bring your ass over here because I'm about to snap it. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I insulted her, if I'm honest. That's it? All you did was insult her? You are so sweet. Because what the fuck you mean? I insulted her, if I'm honest. Baby girl, that wasn't the worst that you could have done. I would have walked to her house. I'm not even going to drive. I'm going to walk over there so I have time to think about the damage I'm about to do. I insulted her, if I'm honest. I said she was a terrible parent and treated my daughter terribly. That's not an insult, mama. Those are facts. She let her walk home alone while well, with the child, but a parent should have been with her. She should have called me the second my daughter was hurt. She insulted me back and it was a whole mess. I told my daughter and my son that they can't go over to that house anymore because the kid's parents are clearly insane. My daughter is especially sad about this because that's her best friend, but I do think this is for the best. I don't feel comfortable leaving them alone together. I feel like those parents are neglectful. Girl, if you don't call the people, I'm calling the motherfucking people. I'm calling her job because what type of fucking nurse allows a 13 year old child to break her arm? No, that the girl's arm is fucking broke and then decides I'm too tired to take her to the hospital and you're going to make a big deal about nothing. I'm calling everybody I fucking can. I'm blasting this bitch on social media because what the fuck? What the fuck? Nah, baby, you're not the asshole. No, not at all. You handled this with a lot more restraint and grace than I will ever possess. Ever. Because ain't no fucking way in hell my 13-year-old baby girl gonna walk in my house with a broken arm. That happened last night with no parents around her. And when I call the parent, she tells me that you're making a big deal about nothing. And I was too tired to take her to the hospital. But you knew after the fact that she seemed happy and she was playing, yet you never picked up your fucking phone to let me know. Girl, uh-uh, the damage that I would have done. The damage that I would have done to this woman. She would no longer be a nurse. She would be a patient with a capital P because are you fucking kidding me? Nah, your kids do not need to ever go back to that fucking house because clearly they don't give a fuck about what happens to kids over there. Because no, hell no. When kids get skinned knees around me, I'm taking pictures and videos and send them to their mama. In case they leg fall off later, I did put some peroxide and a band-aid on it. So you might need to go get them checked out. Ain't no way in hell somebody's going to break their arm under my watch and I'm going to take a nap. <clears throat> Ain't enough tired in the fucking world. Y'all, I fucking cannot. I cannot. Like, it did not click to me until she said she was too tired to take her to the hospital. And I can't fucking let that go. This lady is fucking crazy. Hell no. No. Am I the asshole for breaking up with my girlfriend after she rejected my proposal twice? Sierra and I have been dating for four years. I absolutely love her and felt like she was my soulmate. I knew I wanted to propose two years into dating, but I decided to wait one more year so that I could get in a better situation financially. Last year, I proposed. It was a private proposal on the beach where we went on our first date. She looked at me and said, I want to marry you, but not right now. She said she wasn't in the right space personally to get engaged and to give her some time. That stung, but I was okay with it. After all, I put off proposing so that I could be in a good position. It's only fair I give her the chance. It's been a year since then, and I decided to propose again. This time, I asked our friends to help me set it up because I wanted to do something nicer. We orchestrated a nice dinner and a proposal in front of a nice fountain in the city's botanical garden. Everything was ready. Dinner went great, and we went to the fountain. She saw the roses and everything, and then I got down on one knee and asked her to marry me. She teared up and told me, not just yet. This stung really bad. I knew I wanted her in my life forever but this was the second time she turned me down. I asked her why, and she told me the same thing as last year. I asked her if someone was holding her back, maybe family or a friend, and she just said, I just wanna make sure this will work. 
This hurt me more than the two rejections. I told her after four years she isn't sure, then what will make her sure? She asked me to give her time and I told her no. I told her that I'm not going to keep wasting my time and love if she's just going to keep saying no. I told her that I can't do this anymore. She began begging me not to leave and said, fine, I'll marry you, just please don't go. That made me mad, but I didn't say anything. I left. My phone has been blowing up with some of our friends, her parents, and her telling me that I'm an asshole for throwing away a four-year relationship because she said no, and that I was being a big baby. She just needs some time. The other half of our friends aren't on my side, but they're not on hers either. I don't think I'm an asshole for this, but did I overreact? Am I an asshole? And if so, how much more time am I supposed to give her? There's three edits from OP in this post. Edit number one, we are both 29 years old. Edit two, the second proposal wasn't done in front of friends. They just helped me plan it and stuff. It was just her and I. Edit number three, we had discussed marriage shortly before I proposed the first time. She was into it and even told me she couldn't see herself with anyone else. She seemed eager about the idea of marriage, which is why I was shocked the first time and then angry the second time. Story time about how my boyfriend was hiding his two-year relationship from me. So a little background information, I was 18 and a senior in high school. And in the middle of the school year, I had a new student in my fourth period class who we're going to call Jose and he was 17 years old and in 11th grade. Now he wasn't technically new because I'd seen him around school and everything like that. But up until this point, neither of us knew that each other existed. So he gets introduced to the class, blah, blah, blah. He sits in the very back of the room. And I knew that this man was going to be my boyfriend. So when I got home that day, I was texting my friend about him. Thankfully, she gave me his Snapchat. Fast forward, we're talking and elevators get brought up. Now in my school, you are not allowed to use the elevators unless you're injured or for some other reason. Well, he was talking about how he always used the elevators and nobody really cared. So I meet him at the elevator the next day and blah, blah, blah. We start flirting. And this led to him and I being super close. Like we would FaceTime every day. We would always sit together at lunch in class. Like for part two. Part two about how my boyfriend was hiding his two year relationship from me. So like I said, every day after that, him and I were pretty much inseparable. We would FaceTime literally 24 seven. We would always sit together during lunch, during class. Well, the one day I'm sitting in my homeroom and he comes in and he asked me to be his girlfriend. Of course I said yes. So fast forward to Halloween, my family was handing out candy and he was going trick or treating with his family because he had younger siblings. And this is where our families were supposed to meet, but he didn't end up coming to my neighborhood, which I was super happy about. Well, then fast forward to my birthday. Our families were supposed to meet again, but it didn't end up happening again. And I wasn't really sure if this was the reason why things got weird between him and I. The one night I was over at my friend's house and Jose's on FaceTime with me. And I was talking about how I could pick him up and him and I could hang out. And he literally just didn't even say anything. So I was like, okay, is that a no? So then he was like, uh, I don't know, I might be busy, blah, 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 like for part three. Part three about how my boyfriend was hiding his two-year relationship from me. So like I said, him and I are on FaceTime, I'm asking him if he wants to hang out, and he's being super weird about it, being super standoffish. Well, fast forward a little bit, he seemed like he wasn't interested in me anymore, and it really hurt my feelings, obviously. So he didn't talk to me the rest of the day, and then he texted me the next day. And he was telling me how different we are, and how we barely have anything in common, and how we rushed into things. Pretty much a bunch of shitty excuses as to why he thinks that we should break up. Well, after that, him and I don't speak for a few days, and then I had a fake account on Instagram. And after our breakup, I viewed his story the one day. So then I look at his Instagram story. He posted a picture of another girl with a heart. And then I found her account and she had pictures of them dating back from like two years ago. Now, still to this day, I don't know if he was cheating on her or if they were on a break or whatever. But I also thought that it was weird that they were dating because she was 19 and he was 17. My 29 female boyfriend, 25 male, says he doesn't get jealous because no other man would want me. They try to tear down your self-esteem so that you can never think you can do better, which is the quite opposite because they know you could do better and they try to gaslight you into thinking that this is the best you can do. I've been dating my boyfriend for five months now and he has a very blunt personality. We live in Korea for context. He is Korean and I am not. Most Korean women are slim and petite. I am short, stocky, and recently, because of a hormonal imbalance, I've gained a lot of weight. I am now on a realistic meal plan designed by a dietitian, with my hormone issue kept in mind. As well as this, I go to a boxing gym 3 times a week and walking 40 minutes every day. Today, my boxing trainer posted a video of me on Instagram doing the training and the caption was, She is growing in strength every day. She is beautiful and after her diet, she will be the most beautiful. 
I showed my boyfriend just because I felt like a badass during the boxing training. I am not sporty or well coordinated at all. And he laughed and said it's a marketing tactic. I agreed with that. Then suddenly he said, I see you're inside, that's why I'm with you. Not because of your outside. But I am not worried about anyone stealing you because no other man will ever just see your inside and not the way you look on the outside. The statement hurt me a lot because while I'm overweight, I don't think I'm necessarily unattractive. I take pride in my clothing, my hair, my makeup, and always try to present myself as best as I can. Before I met him, I also went on plenty of dates. I guess I want to know, what would you do in this situation? This isn't the first time he has made comments about my body. His nickname for me is the Korean word for fatty, but it never bothered me much until he said what he said. My self-esteem is on the ground. Oh, she has updates. Thank you all for the comments and advice. I really appreciate it. I have spoken to him and have decided to take a step back from the relationship. I want to concentrate on my weight loss and fitness journey and I need to be in a positive headspace for that, which I can't be with him. Some people have mentioned the cultural aspect and I agree. It is a cultural issue, but it isn't something I'm used to. I have never had the men in my life talk to me that way, so I can't just chalk it all down to culture. I saw a few comments mentioning the whole K-pop slash K-drama fantasy and what did I expect? I have lived and worked in Korea for almost 5 years. I am very much aware of the beauty standards, culture, and language. This is my first serious relationship since living here. I just happened to meet a Korean man. He was in my proximity, we hit it off, and then he changed. I wasn't expecting a K-drama romance. I was just expecting a romantic partnership. My ex-husband, who cheated on me with my sister, emailed me six years later. I met my ex-husband, Dan, about 15 years ago when I was celebrating my 18th birthday. He was really nice, charming, and mature. He made me feel super special and loved. For context, I grew up in a pretty dysfunctional family. My mom and dad would always fight, and my dad would sometimes leave and not come back for months. He died when my sister Abby, who is now 25 years old, was born. And let's just say my mom did her best when she was raising us, but she definitely had a favorite and it was not me. She was always babying my little sister Abby. After Dan came into my life, I just didn't feel like something was missing anymore like I did before. He was so supportive and so caring. He would always buy me gifts and take me out on long drives and I just felt complete when he was with me. We got married after dating for four years and I really wanted to start a family right away but Dan encouraged me to do my masters. He really helped me to build my career. He wanted us to be in a stable financial position before we even thought about starting a family and he seriously was the best guy ever. After five years of being happily married, I found out that my husband was cheating on me with my little sister, Abby. My ex-husband, who cheated on me with my sister, emailed me six years later. After five years of being happily married, I found out that my husband was cheating on me with my little sister, Abby. I discovered the affair when my husband said that he was going to go out of town for a week, but he really stayed in town and just booked a hotel for him and my little sister, Abby, to sleep together. This had been going on for six months behind my back. I was really devastated when I found this out. Abby and I were super close when we were little and I felt like I loved her and cared for her so much. After that day, Dan and I had a huge fight and I asked him how he could do this to me, especially with my sister who had just turned 19. He said that he wasn't in love with me anymore, that I don't give him enough attention and I'm not the same girl that he fell in love with. Between this mess, I found out that I was pregnant, but due to all the stress, I lost the baby and he didn't even come to visit me in the hospital because he was on a weekend getaway trip with my little sister. I should have seen the signs because my sister was always super touchy with Dan and sometimes I would catch Dan just staring at my little sister. Even despite seeing the signs, it's still very disturbing to me. And of course, my mom took Abby's side and told me just to make peace with it. Am I the asshole for asking my fiance to skip this year's Christmas family vacation because our baby is due? Context. I've gone to Florida with his family for the past five years for at least part of Christmas. Every other year, I returned before him to spend Christmas Day with my family. This year is the first time in a long time that all the other siblings are able to overlap dates. My fiance has major FOMO, which is why this is a sensitive subject. His parents have always been weird about keeping their family close. 
They've never said it outright, but little things suggest they don't consider me completely part of their family yet since we aren't married. Also, my parents are overseas dealing with a grandparent emergency. My mom has been kept in the loop though and is trying to come back as soon as she can. My fiance and I are expecting our first baby due December 30th. His family has a vacation home in Florida and they have gone every year during the holidays for about a month until after New Year's. He agreed not to go this year because of the baby, but his family is insisting that he go and come back on the 28th, which is, quote, ample time before the baby is due. So he bought tickets for December 15th through the 28th. His reasoning is that his parents really want him there and his siblings will also be going. This is bothering me a lot more than I thought because I know pregnancies are unpredictable, especially in the last trimester. And if anything happens leading up to the due date, I need him here. The other reason I guess it's more selfish is that I will be spending Christmas by myself. It's not the main reason why I'm bothered, but it's a small part of it. My parents are away until December 26, and my friends have their families, so I'll be completely alone. He's been spending Christmas every year in Florida since he was 15, and there will be many more trips after the baby is born. I don't know why he has to go this year. Anytime I bring it up, it results in a very uncomfortable fight about my expectations to put me first rather than his parents. I don't even bring it up anymore. His parents have always been kind to me, but they also don't see any problems, so I think I'm going crazy. Am I the asshole here? Am I wrong for canceling the entire vacation when I found out that my stepdaughter deliberately hid my daughter's passport to get her to stay home? I've been married to my wife, Beth, for five years. I have a biological daughter named Jessica, she's 18, and I have two stepdaughters named Monica and Leah. They're 25 and 28. Both are single moms and live with us currently. There's been issues about my stepdaughters asking my daughter to babysit the kids. Jessica didn't have a problem with it at first since this is what she does to earn money, but since her stepsisters don't pay her much, she just refused to babysit. We worked this out by having my wife take care of paying for the babysitting. I planned a family vacation for three days and everyone wanted to go. However, both Monica and Leah suggested that Jessica stay home and watch the kids since Beth doesn't want her grandkids to come. They said it's because the kids are used to Jessica and hiring another babysitter would cause issues. They also said that Jessica isn't too fond of our destination but it was obvious that Jessica wanted to go. They insisted and Beth offered to pay her double and there was just a lot of back and forth on this until I demanded they stop bringing it up. We were supposed to go last week and everyone had their bags and we were at the airport and it was time to go. Jessica found out that she didn't have her passport on her. We searched her bag, then went home and searched there. Beth and my stepdaughters kept insisting that we go back to the airport or else we'd miss our flight. They insisted that Jessica stay at home with the kids. They even told the new babysitter to go home because she was no longer needed. I refused to go and kept searching for the passport until Monica admitted that she helped Leah hide Jessica's passport to get her to stay home with the kids. I was livid. I tried to get her to tell me where it was, but she said Leah had it. Leah denied, so I threatened to cancel the vacation, and that's when they gave it back. I decided to actually cancel the vacation and blew up at both of them and berated them. They stayed upstairs for a while and Beth refused to speak to me and said that I punished my stepdaughters for worrying about their kids and wanting them to stay with someone they know. I got told I overreacted and ruined the trip for everybody. I asked for a postnup and my husband is furious. My husband and I are both in our early 30s and we have a 10 year old from his prior relationship. We've been thinking about having a few of our own. And he's really excited about it and asked if we could start trying next month. I was elated, but I also started thinking about how having more kids was going to impact our life. I work and also have a side business, which I'm actively trying to turn into my full-time job. I love this field and I've also been very vocal about not wanting to be a stay-at-home mom. I also want more kids, so I have to figure out how to make that work. My husband is very supportive of this idea. Now on to him. He works full times, is currently completing his master's, and he wants to pursue his PhD. And if you're not familiar with a PhD, you need to quit your job and spend the next five to eight years completing it. I'm supportive of this too and have no issue being the primary income source during that time. And he wants to apply to one of the Ivy schools out of state. So I played out the scenario in my head just to see what it might look like. And I see myself working full time and pursuing my business, raising multiple kids and maintaining the home, and essentially keep everything running while my husband spends multiple weeks out of state. 
while going to school. And that is not a reality that I want to live in. Even if I'm able to afford hired help at some point, I'm worried my husband is setting himself up to be absent, whether he realizes this or not. I've brought this up to him and he keeps brushing it off saying it won't be like this, but he's not willing to sit down with me and talk about the possibility and walk through what might realistically happen. I didn't feel heard, so I asked him for a postnuptial agreement so I can easily put my expectations down in writing. I can easily see how this situation could ruin a marriage. I simply wanted to establish boundaries, like I'm willing to support his PhD, but he has to go to an in-state school within a certain amount of miles from the house, within X miles from the house, so that he can be present X days per week. There's literally a prestigious university 30 minutes from the house, but he lost interest in it. He can add in his two cents in the postnup as well. I'm not trying to control his life. I'm just trying to avoid ending up a single married mom. So what do you guys think? Am I wrong for going about it in this way? Bye.